Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport, then this is the podcast for you. Today, I'm with Dr. Tom Clifford, Dr. Will Abbott and Lauren Delaney, and we're here to talk about recovery in team sports. We'll hear Tom discuss the muscle physiology behind recovery. Will gives us his practical insights into the recovery philosophy within Premier League Football Academy at Brighton and Hove Albion, highlighting their focus on three key areas of sleep, hydration and nutrition, and providing some excellent tips. Before Lauren gives us some advice on nutrition strategies for recovery, with some specific examples to enhance recovery in tournament scenarios such as the Olympics or European Championships, when athletes may have only 48 hours to recover. Okay, so before we get started, can we just have a brief introduction from, from you all, starting with you yourself, Tom? Yeah, hi, Martin. So my name's Tom Clifford. I'm a lecturer in physiology and nutrition at Loughborough University. Most of my research is all focused on recovery and particularly nutrition for recovery. And Lauren? Yeah, hi, Martin. So I'm a registered dietitian and performance nutritionist. I'm currently doing my PhD with Leeds Rhinos Rugby League team as their nutritionist and looking into body composition and behaviour change science. And I'm also a rugby union player for Sail Sharks and Ireland women's senior team. Thanks, Lauren. And Will? Hi, Martin. I'm currently the, uh, the Academy Performance Manager at, at Brighton Hove Albion Football Club. So this involves overseeing all of the, the science and medical provisions that, that we provide our academy players. So ranging right the way up from under nines to, to under 23s. I'm a, I'm a strength and conditioning coach by trade and I've recently completed a PhD as well, focusing upon the, the monitoring and prescription of training load in professional footballers. Excellent. It looks like we've got three really good rounded experts to help us talk about recovery and recovery specifically in team sports. So Let's move on to some questions. And I think we want Tom to kick us off. So just Tom, just let us know what, what is recovery and muscle damage within the context of exercise? What are we talking about? Yeah, sure. So when people talk about exercise recovery, they're often referring to two different types. So you can have short term or rapid recovery, which is recovery between successive sprints or maybe sets in the gym. But on the other hand, we also have what's known as training and competition recovery which is essentially, as it suggests, is the recovery between individual training sessions and competitions. An example of this type of recovery could be a period between finishing a football match on a Saturday afternoon to when you may be starting another match on a Tuesday evening. In either definition, the aim of this recovery period is always to facilitate a return to homeostasis, so just to get us back to that starting point so that when we come to do exercise again, we can work at the same intensity. And I suppose just to expand on that a little bit and go into the muscle damage aspect a little bit more, we know that even if you're a very elite athlete, you do still experience quite a protracted recovery period. So it can still take quite a few days. And there's several reasons for this recovery, this long lengthened recovery period. It's, it's definitely multifaceted, but if we look at some of the main physiological factors that we're aware of, one of them would be central fatigue, which is essentially when the brain is not actually talking to the muscles correctly. We've also got peripheral fatigue, where the muscle cell is dysfunctional in some way. Often this is due to some kind of damage to the proteins that help us contract our muscles. And part of this is linked to inflammation as well which is something that we're always going to experience in team sports because we do so many repetitive, explosive movements that require large muscle groups. And this often does lead to some kind of muscle damage and inflammatory response. But they're kind of the underlying mechanisms. What most people experience in team sports in terms of recovery and muscle damage is that they feel sore, their muscles are tender, they're swollen, and there's also a reduction in force. So your ability to sprint as fast or jump as high or push as much is actually going to be impaired in some kind of way. So if this lasts for several days, this can obviously have quite a negative impact on your performance and training. So 
in this podcast, really, I suppose what we're mostly talking about and, and referring to when it comes to manager recovery is going to be between training and competition as opposed to in between sets or in between sprints or something like that. Perfect. And I, I just want to add a question to this. Lactic acid gets a bad press in everything. Is it just lactic acid that causes the problems? Or can you talk me through the actual physiology around this muscle damage that you just mentioned? Yeah, so it's nothing to do with lactic acid. I can say that. So we'll, we'll, we'll nip that one in the bud straight away. We can ignore that. So the muscle damage itself, what happens when you do what we call eccentric muscle contractions quite often? So when the muscle is actually lengthening under tension. So if you think of when you're sprinting and then you decelerate, you accelerate, your big large muscle groups in your legs are going to be doing some form of eccentric muscle contractions. And this is what often causes muscle damage. And in terms of muscle damage, we often just mean that some of the contractile elements have been impaired in some kind of way. They're not going to be functioning as they normally would. Now, immediately after exercise, you'll partly have what's called fatigue, and you might also have some muscle damage as well. But the biggest problem is going to be is that your muscles will not contract like they usually should. And that's more of a problem of calcium handling within the muscle. So calcium is really important for muscle contraction. But when it gets disrupted, when you perform exercise like this, it means that you can't actually produce the same amount of force. Now, what happens over those ensuing days afterwards is you've often got an inflammatory response and various immune cells are released. They go towards the muscle, they release other cells, and you just keep getting this process of the whole point is regenerating and repairing the tissues. But when they're trying to repair and regenerate, they might also cause a little bit of extra damage. And so what happens is you're still feeling sore your muscle function is still going to be decreased and it's going to take quite a few days for that to be resolved. And it does very much depend on the intensity. I mean, if you think of somebody who's not gone to the gym for six, seven, eight months or something like that, just getting back into it, probably like people will be after this pandemic, they'll feel sore for days afterwards. And the more untrained you are, the more unaccustomed you are to this exercise, the worse it tends to be. So the longer you'll be sore for, the longer you'll have deficits in muscle function and the bigger amount of inflammation you're going to have. But I suppose it, that's a long way to answer it, but to sum it up shortly, lactic acid is not involved and the reality is this protracted lengthening decrease in muscle function, increase in muscle soreness is probably more linked to inflammation and other biochemical changes within the body that continue for quite a few days after exercise. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for adding to that. Obviously, the reason I mentioned lactic acid is because people say it all the time. And obviously, depending on the level of person that's listening, I just think I wanted to put some context on that, that lactic acid is nothing to do with this. So really, really well explained. Thank you. So we talked about that kind of physiological elements and muscle damage. Why then, it could seem an obvious question, but why is recovery so important for, for team sports athletes, but I suppose any athletes for who are repeating exercises in a few days time yeah yeah and I, and I think team sports I suppose that the reason my research focuses and my interest is in team sports is the big reason that recovery is so important is just the recovery time that they have it's so limited so if we look at if you were to go and do a marathon race for example it's it's not likely that you're going to be doing another marathon race anytime soon or even within the next few months or so so when it comes to team sports, they're often only having maybe two, three days in between actual competition. So training is important, but obviously competition is what you're trying to peak for. And if you're, I gave the example earlier of a football player, you might have to try and peak two to three times a week, which is really challenging. And equally, a, a good example at the moment is the Netball Super League's on. Um, and due to the pandemic, the matches are being played on back-to-back -back days. So they've got sometimes 24, maybe 30 hours to recover between quite intense exercise. And a great example, again, is the Olympics. These In these tournament situations, you've got sports like hockey, handball. Again, they probably have 24 to 48 hours to recover between matches. And if we look at the research, that just isn't quite enough time 
for individuals to stop feeling sore and actually to make sure that their, their back, their muscle function is back to what it was pre-exercise levels. They tend to actually need a little bit longer. Good shout out there, Tom. Shout out for Loughborough Lightning, who won last night. So <laughs> yeah. nice, nice one, Tom. Nice plug there for them. <laughs> um, so, Will, in your role in football, what, what does this look like, kind of recovery through different age groups? Because I'm aware, you know, intensities, duration of exercise, things like that are all, are all different through, through age groups in football academies, for example. So what does the philosophy look like within, within football? Yeah, so I think that the first really important point to make is that I suppose in a role such as mine, where you're you're heading up the the science and medical provisions for an entire academy, under 23s down to to under nines, you've got lots of different athletes with with lots of I suppose different circumstances and different stages of development. So as as a group of staff within our department, we have to have a sort of cohesive progressive long-term plan for for our academy athletes that that will hopefully be with us from under nine all the way up to to under 23s so the reason being that is if one of our staff members at under 15s is is doing one thing and another staff member at under 16s is is doing a completely different thing that the program's never going to be as as effective as as potentially it could be so as a result, we as a department have, have dedicated, I suppose, a significant amount of time towards identifying and, and formulating like our philosophy. And this is split into on the pitch and, and off the pitch. So off the pitch where, where recovery is going to fall, our philosophy is, is basically centered around educating the players to make the correct decisions to support their own health, their own well-being and their own performance on the pitch, ultimately so that they can make the, the right decisions and they don't have to rely on us to, to tell them what to do. So with regards to the, the philosophy specific to, to recovery, within the, the academy, we, we focus upon what's going to give us the, the biggest return on investment for our time. So due to things like school and, and other sort of life commitments, we, we might have limited access to, to some of the age groups and some of the squads, you know, even more so now with, with COVID. So it becomes about what we can we can try and affect in the window of time that that we have the players and certainly within an academy setting and certainly in my role it, it comes down to focusing upon the basics of which we've we've highlighted i suppose the big 3 as as nutrition hydration and and sleep so the the messages that we send to to our academy players of all ages so under 9s all the way up to under 23s is if you ensure that your hydration, your nutrition and your sleep habits are good, then you're, you're 90% of, of the way there already. And, and everything else that you do needs to be on top of this. So first and foremost, you know, focus your efforts upon upon those big three. And, and I suppose that's not to say that that's all we do. But certainly if, if the big three are, are being looked after, we've got license to progress on to on to some other methods aside from nutrition hydration and sleep there's very mixed research out there on on recovery you know active recovery foam rolling ice baths compression garments nutritional supplements do they work do they not some research supports it other research doesn't that being said there's there's certainly evidence out there to suggest that that the mind has a huge influence upon recovery and, and recovery modalities so if you believe a modality works then there's an increased likelihood of, of it having a positive effect. If you don't believe it works, then then there's less likely, a, a, you know, a chance that, that it will work. So as a result, we have the approach with within the academy of providing the younger age groups access to, to a wide range of, of different recovery modalities and, and being quite, I suppose, prescriptive with it. But the older age groups, we we provide them with with choices and options. And I suppose an example of this would be you know, if we've got a 20 year old player towards the, the older end of our academy who absolutely hates the ice bath and doesn't believe that, that it works for him, then we're probably doing more harm than good by forcing him in there and, and forcing the rest of the, the squad in there as well. So instead, can we provide options for the older age groups with regards to, to the recovery modalities and, and let them find what, what works for them? But it is important that, that the players have, I suppose, experimented with a range of recovery modalities in the first place at younger age groups. Otherwise, they'll have no referential experience of, of what potentially does or, or doesn't work for them. So I suppose a good way we've found of implementing it with, with our older athletes is to create a little bit of a recovery checklist saying that, look, before you, you leave the training ground today, you've, you've got to collect five points 
and you might get three points for 20 minutes on the bike or 20 minutes foam rolling or completing the mobility circuit and you might get two points for you know wearing your compression garments getting a massage or, or 20 minutes spent stretching for example so it's proved a good way to ensure that at least the players are doing something proactive towards their recovery but also providing them the the freedom to i suppose find a modality that, that works for them as an individual and where do you, where do you find players tend to tend to lean towards re- regarding that recovery are people jumping out in ice, ice baths still or are they lying down and having a massage for an hour because that's much more fun in my eyes yeah, I think you've, you've you hit the nail on the head. They they generally do the thing that's easiest <laughs> for them to do. So if it's something passive like a massage, you know, they they probably prefer to do that. We've got some who you know swear by ice baths and and will be in them every day, and that's absolutely fine. But I suppose in the back of our mind, we've got right as long as we've ticked off the hydration, the nutrition, and the sleep, anything on top of that is is more of a a bonus, I suppose. So it's not any of those methods we don't think any of them are doing any harm and they may be enhancing recovery is that that's kind of what we're saying there isn't it certainly with yeah the 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 ones i mentioned later on like yeah i suppose your active recovery and your cold baths and things like that there's not as much i suppose cold hard research proving it's it's sort of efficacy compared to hydration nutrition and, and sleep so that's how we approach it from from our perspective so just, I mean, you can touch on on those three a, a little bit and we'll bring Lauren in just in a moment. But how, how would you approach a, a congested fixture kind of schedule? Potentially, let's talk maybe the 18s or the 21s. What are those bits of advice that you would give them on the big three that you've spoken about? And then obviously you've spoken about the other options. But can you just talk us through how that might work if they've got a game, let's say, on a on a Saturday and a Tuesday? Yeah, I suppose there's look, it's something that we've had a lot of experience with, certainly in football and, and certainly this season with with COVID and, and sort of affecting the, the length of the season and, and the amount of games that have been postponed. I suppose there's a couple of ways to, to sort of attack this question, really. How would we approach a congested fixture period from more of a longer term perspective? And then how would we approach a congested fixture period from more of a, a short term perspective? So firstly, from a longer term perspective, the question is, what can we do to to either mitigate the effects of, of a spike in training load that we're likely to get from a congested period of, of games? Or longer term, again, what can we do to develop the player's ability to recover quicker from, from bouts of high intensity activity? And then secondly, for more of a shorter term perspective, what can we do to, do to, to sort of speed up the, the recovery time of our players in between a Saturday and and the Tuesday game. So I suppose if if we focus upon the first part, the longer term perspective to to begin with, you know, what can we do to mitigate the effects of of a spike in training load that we're going to get through a, a congested period of games? The, the the question's answered really well by some of Hewlin and Gabbett's work around training stress balance or, or the acute chronic workload ratio. And for those who aren't familiar, it, it basically the training stress balance provides us with an idea of of a player's ability to tolerate increases in in training load and and the consequential risk of of injury so it's a relationship between what they've done in the short term maybe over the past week and what they've done in the long term over the past four weeks or so so the acute load and the chronic load so if you've got a relatively high chronic load and a relative low relatively low acute load you've got an increased readiness to to tolerate you know, spikes in training load and training load and, and congested fixtures and, and a subsequent lower risk of, of injury. If it's the other way around and you've got a relatively low chronic training load and a relatively high acute load, the, the result is a decreased readiness to, to tolerate training loads and, and spikes in training load and a higher risk of injury. So the, the research basically highlights a few things. Firstly, the high training loads and the spikes in I suppose that fixture congestion and things like that aren't necessarily a an issue as long as the, the the training load, the high training load has, has been reached gradually. And secondly, spikes or, or sudden increases in training load are what increase the, the, the risk of an athlete picking up an injury. So these spikes in, in training load are less likely to occur when an individual's got a higher training load, a higher chronic training load, as it takes more training load to, to sort of spike an individual that, than it does an individual with a lower chronic training load. So if we know there's going to be a, a spike in training load because of the upcoming fixture congestion, 
then we can prepare our players to tolerate this by gradually building up their, their sort of chronic training load and, and ensuring that that spike caused by the congested schedule is, is less in, in sort of relative terms. With regards to, I suppose, developing physical qualities to help protect the players from, from spikes in training load, there's been some really positive research around aerobic fitness and, and muscular strength specifically. So Malone et al. Uh, suggested there's a, a correlation between aerobic fitness and injury occurrence. So they looked at some of the associations in workload and injury occurrence in, in their Gaelic footballers over the course of a season and, and factored in each individual's aerobic fitness. And the results basically suggested that individuals with poor levels of aerobic fitness had a higher injury risk compared to those with higher levels of, of fitness. So aerobic fitness can actually help mediate against some of the spikes in training load and, and consequently reduce the risk of injury. And then with regards to, to muscular strength, we've actually conducted an investigation at the club with, with the help of Tom examining the, the influence of muscular strength upon recovery from, from football competition. So this is currently under review at the minute. So we had a squad of players complete an isometric mid-thigh pull test, split them into high and low strength groups based upon their, their scores. And then we tracked their physical and, and their perceived recovery following some football matches and found that the, the relatively stronger players recovered quicker following competition compared to, to the relatively weaker players. So some, some really, really interesting findings for us to, to sort of put into practice and, and ones that are specific to, to our cohort. And I suppose that the final part of that question, you know, what can we look to do once we're within those congested periods of, of games and, and sort of off the back of a Saturday fixture coming up to a Tuesday fixture? Our philosophy has always been, been centred around, you know, those big three, nutrition, hydration, sleep. So trying to prioritise these. Are the players receiving quality nutrition and hydration straight after the games and in between the, the, the matches as well? More difficult when you're playing away from home compared to at home. We'll also adjust our, our schedules to ensure the players are getting the necessary amount of sleep off the back of the games. So maybe setting a, a later report time the next day if if we've got back late the, the night before. Again, really important if if we're playing away from home in, in sort of a, an evening fixture. So yeah, once we've prioritised those those big three, we sort of turn our, our, our heads towards perhaps a, a few other ro recovery modalities that, that we might trial out. So we've Again, with the help of Tom, conducted a handful of investigations focusing upon the efficacy of certain recovery modalities, things like tart cherry juice, portable cooling garments, casein protein, things like that. But only after the, the, the big three are sort of adhered to, really. And, and so ju just from them, because I've seen some, some of your papers on that, the, the casein before sleep seemed, seemed to show some good results. Yeah, yeah, that was that was probably our most successful investigation, certainly with regards to the the results. So we had we had a squad of players there that that took part in football matches on on two separate occasions. One one occasion they they received the the casein protein. Another occasion they they received a, like a carbohydrate control drink prior to to going to bed. The players were, were sort of blinded as to which one they were they were taking, and we collected uh, physical and, and perceived markers of recovery baseline 12 hours, 36 hours, 60 hours post-match to, to determine how their, their sort of perceived and physical recovery was off the back of these, these two interventions. But certainly we found from, from a physical perspective that the casein worked really well for us, yeah. And just, just to take a little step back, you mentioned, you mentioned Gabbit and you've mentioned training load. So can you just very briefly, because it could be a whole podcast in itself, can you just tell us how you're monitoring training load? Is, is that through kind of the RPE side of things or GPS and heart rates? Where, where are you with monitoring? Yeah, so what, what we try and do is, is take one marker of external training load uh, and one marker of internal training load. So the external training load is basically how much work is completed. And typically we'd either do, we'd either use GPS most, most frequently to do that with our older age group. So you get markers such as total distance or sprinting distance that, that tells you how much work each individual has done during each session. And the internal training load, we'd use either heart rate or, or RPE. And that basically tells you the effect of that load, the external load upon the body. So what's the body's response to that? either using an RPE scale of, of 1 to 10 or 6 to 20 or, or using heart rate and looking at, I suppose, red zone minutes or, or max heart rate 
and, and things like that. So it varies depending upon which age group we're talking about. We do more with our older age groups compared to you know our younger age groups, but we try and take an external and an internal marker of, of training load if we can. I just wanted to add that for a bit of context for, for training load for people to have a think about, but it probably makes me think maybe we should do a podcast all about training load. Um, <laughs> I had a bit of an interest in it previously, so we could we could re- review that another time. Lauren, I know you sat there very patiently, and I know we're going to talk about nutrition generally. So if, if we start with nutrition, and, and obviously Will's mentioned it there, what kind of foods are we talking about that might, might aid recovery? It's a very big question. Yeah, absolutely. Re- really big question to start with. I suppose for, for me, the the big kind of four R's of recovery that we always talk about in nutrition from a practical point of view is all about refueling those energy stores and the glycogen and carbohydrate stores that you've used during exercise. So with a source of carbohydrate, you're looking at repairing that kind of muscle damage that Tom mentioned earlier with a source of protein. You're looking to rehydrate uh, and replace any of those fluids and electrolytes that you've lost through sweat. And then the final one is all around reinforcing your immune system and again, supporting that inflammation that, that Tom mentioned earlier. So a real practical point and and one that's probably one of the most researched food in terms of recovery is looking at milk. So you've got a, a source of, of protein there, you've got a source of carbohydrate, and um, it's obviously a fluid and, and there's vitamins and minerals in there to, to help support the body. We can kind of adapt milk quite easily in terms of increasing the carbohydrate in it by, by choosing your flavoured milks, your chocolate milks, your strawberries, strawberry milk, adding things like Nesquik and, and chocolate flavourings to it, again, to increase the carbohydrate intake for those higher training loads in particular. There are certainly, you know, we don't have to go down the route of of fluids always, but normally they're quite an easy option to tick all boxes. Another option that that's really good, especially coming into the summer months, is looking towards things like smoothies. So having a blend of things like your milks and your yogurts in terms of a source of protein, adding things like oats or honey or bananas and then adding in different types of, of fruits and vegetables in there, depending what, what flavours you want. Alternatively, you know, there, there's a lot of people out there that aren't keen on, on liquid options straight after training sessions or, or different games and food based options like cereal and milk or going down the simple route of ham or, or chicken sandwiches sometimes is is a really simple option alongside some fluid that yeah that's an easy one to to tick a few boxes but there's a lot of different foods and different food groups that can fit into those recovery strategies for me it's finding the the right option for, for each athlete depending on their appetite how what type of training sessions or, or games or competitions they've had and I suppose what Tom mentioned earlier around how long they have in terms of recovery before their next event or before their next training session is a really important part as well with with what choice you you might look at and and can we just touch upon supplements then I want to touch a bit more on the, the practical side of this so obviously supplements you know can help is are there any recommendations you have regarding supplements yeah absolutely so I suppose when we're first looking at supplements most of the time we, we have to break it down into the different types of supplements so you've got your food-based sports foods like your recovery shakes, your whey proteins, your your kind of energies and protein bars. You've got your type of vitamin and mineral supplements like your omega-3s, vitamins and multivitamins. And you've also got some ergogenic aids that are, are a little bit different again. In terms of recovery, as I mentioned earlier, milk is is pretty much probably the the most researched food out there and I suppose not just in terms of individual nutrients and their impact on their recovery but almost milk as a food matrix itself can can definitely help speed up that recovery in terms of I suppose living in the world that we are at the minute in terms of the pandemic access to fridges and and when we're traveling fresh foods are, can be quite difficult to come by so that's where some options around powdered supplements recovery supplements with whey protein and carbohydrates in them from a convenience point of view can be be really good and really handy and especially good for for a backup in, in particular 
obviously looking more at more specific recovery in the evening times, uh, as Will mentioned earlier, in terms of that, that casein protein being a, another option. Uh, again, where do we get casein? We get it from milk. So if milk and, and yogurt or, or cottage cheese, for example, are, are accessible to, to athletes, they're, they're really good options to have. Again, from, from a convenience point of view, sometimes we're not able to access those foods or, or fluids in terms of access to fridges or supermarkets. So again, a casein-based supplement powder can be a bit more convenient there in the evening times. Some other things, if we're looking a bit more around so, some replacements of, of vitamins and minerals or those elements, electrolyte tablets can be ha quite handy in terms of helping to, to rehydrate athletes. Again, if there's quite minimal amount of time in between games or in between training sessions, or for example, we're going into summer months, looking at Tokyo down the line as well, it's going to be pretty hot and humid. So looking to have potentially some electrolytes in your um, recovery drinks can be quite handy in terms of that rehydration. And then looking a little bit more along those that ergogenic aid, I think Will mentioned early, earlier in terms of Montmorency tart cherry, in terms of that recovery element. So there's probably two different parts of of your tart cherry that, that could impact on performance. So it's a natural source of that melatonin, which is that hormone that we produce in the evening times to prepare ourselves to go to bed. Uh, and we know if we've got kind of a game late at night and we might have had a bit of coffee in the evening times to kind of prep ourselves or or kind of the adrenaline is still going. And sometimes sleep can be a real struggle after games or, or multiple games throughout the day. So some element to help with that sleep and that sleep latency can definitely be there with the, the cherry active. The other side of that as well is it's a concentrated fruit juice. So it's a good source of antioxidants. And again, coming back to what Tom mentioned, around the inflammation and that muscle damage and as well on, on competition days we normally aren't having a lot of fruit and vegetables throughout the day especially in in different tournament scenarios so making sure that we're still getting those antioxidants those vitamins and minerals in the likes of a, a cherry active or a concentrated fruit juice can also be helpful in terms of of that recovery as really really good and, and in-depth stuff and i know None of you like to like to do this. And I, I have this with SNC coaches to try and give us a bit of a prescription for like what's the ultimate kind of recovery. So I'm going to put people on the spot and I didn't warn you I was going to do this, but we'll see what happens. So if you could come up with kind of what is a, a golden approach? And I know everyone's individual and, you know, the, 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 the pieces you've given us before will be individualized. But if you were going to give a generic bit of advice regarding that first hour or first half an hour after the game, what should you be going for? What should people then do to back that up? And then potentially what should they be doing in the evening? So take us through a 24 hour process of nutritional recovery. And then if you could add how that might be changed, as you've mentioned around the Olympics, particularly somewhere like Tokyo where there's heat involved. Yeah, look, it's a good question. I suppose my fallback option that I'll normally talk through with an athlete in terms of that first half an hour to an hour or as soon as possible after a game, for example, would be definitely going for that chocolate milk option. So if you can have 500 to maybe 750 mils of, of chocolate milk, depending on kind of your weight, if I'm talking to a 50 kilo female or maybe a 100 kilo lad, you know, that, that quantity will vary. But again, Chocolate milk is, is definitely an excellent option. If you're heading up towards the 90 or 100 kilo, you might look to have maybe a cereal bar, a banana, something with that within that first half an hour to, to an hour is definitely probably my go to option if possible. The kind of next point of call or almost your phase two of recovery is looking at that next main meal. So if you can get that in within that next two hour time point. And again, there's loads of different options. I mean, probably the easiest one that most people go for or something along the lines of a chicken and vegetable stir fry with some rice or some noodles or, or something along those lines with a, a decent amount of, of fluid or, or water. Again, if, if you're struggling with your appetite, which is quite common with athletes and they might not be keen to have quite a big meal, again, can you maybe add a pint of milk with that with that meal as well to try and get that extra protein or carbohydrate if you're struggling in terms of of quantity of that afternoon meal and then again a pre-bed for me my next best option that that I'd go to in terms of trying to get that hit of slow release protein pre-bed I'd normally go for two to three hundred grams 
of Greek yogurt or, or, or kind of a high protein skier yogurt with with loads of berries and adding some granola to that, maybe some honey as well, um, is a really good pre-bed option. Again, if, if you don't have a big appetite or you don't want to eat solid food, blend that all up together and maybe make it into a bit of a smoothie can be a good option with some extra fluid as well. And then the second part of that question in terms of a tournament fixture or if you had multiple games, the principles probably wouldn't change very much. I'd probably be encouraging if there was less amount of time between the the first and the second game, for example, you might be encouraging a lot of those liquid based sources of carbohydrates. So in between those meals, you might consider some sports drinks or some extra carbohydrates to to be drinking in between those meals just to make sure that we're topping up our carbohydrate stores. And then again, if if we're struggling with with timings of main meals, we could break that down into two smaller meals in the evening times or going even simpler options like some some sandwiches and uh, on kind of white bread and chicken. Again, just things that are really simple and, and easy on the stomach, bowls of cereal. I mean, in uh, rugby camp, Rice Krispies and Cocoa Pops are, are the go to option for us as well. Again, it's a simple source of carbohydrate. You add some milk into it as well. Uh, and if people are really struggling with their appetite, some really simple carbohydrate-based cereals can can be a good go-to option. That's an an excellent answer. And I I just want to add one final bit to this. So we've talked through kind of 24 hours of recovery. So what about the next 24 hours when you know that there's another game coming? So you've got 48 hours between, between fixtures or events. You've started that recovery process with the first 24 hours. Are we doing the same thing on the next 24? Is there a shift in protein at all anywhere? And where does that come kind of pre-game? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. And especially in those tournament scenarios, recovery from one game normally blends into fueling for that next game. I think that those r- really important recovery principles definitely come into play in those first few hours. I think it's really important then leading into those 24 hours into the next game, I suppose, especially in terms of tournament scenarios that you're probably looking at carbohydrate loading a bit more. So focusing on carbohydrate intake at, at each of those main meals and and those snacks a bit as well. Again, you're looking at the, the balance between that protein and carbohydrate intake. So we know our protein based foods are are quite filling. So we've got to make sure that, you know, some athletes aren't going up to buffets, for example, and and filling up on their protein based foods and then struggling to then potentially eat um, some of the carbohydrate based foods on on their plate as well. So trying to get that balance, I think, again, conscious of their their total fiber intake and that um, how filling the meals are. So maybe choosing more white based options of your carbohydrate sources like white rice, white bread, white pasta, which are a bit easier to to eat a, a larger volume. And then I suppose the one thing that I'd be probably OK with with compromising again in terms of those tournament scenarios would be that kind of vegetable intake. Again, if we're filling up on our proteins and are filling up on our vegetable sources, we might end up compromising the, the total carbohydrate intake. And if we've got multiple games back to back, that becomes even more important because we can almost have that accumulation of 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 fatigue or we might not ever really get on top of replacing our glycogen stores with carbohydrates. So that's almost the, the priority. And then hopefully still still keeping protein in each of those those main meals is, is, of course, really important, but not at the compromise of your carbohydrate intake. And it seems just to just to reiterate, we're obviously talking about performance and we're talking about recovery and we're not talking about diets and exercise and, and things like that, where people start to take this information and transfer it into something else. So just to be clear, we're talking about performance, recovery, glycogen stores, all these kind of things that that is what we're covering in, in that topic there. And I've already asked you a final question. So this is going to be a final, final question. So when when people are performing, is there anything that they can be doing during performance to aid recovery, like nutrition supplement wise, half times, those kind of things. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose it, it kind of blends in with that the element earlier of of fueling versus recovery. I suppose our, our point of of fueling, I suppose, 
in terms of fueling with carbohydrates at halftime during games or, or, or when we can during games. It's to probably offset those carbohydrate stores and, and making sure we, we don't tap into those carbohydrate stores as long as possible. So I suppose in terms of that recovery, you do hear a lot of people at the minute talking about having certain kind of protein supplements during gym sessions or, or during games and, and whatnot. And I suppose that the biggest priority during games and and in the middle of, of training sessions has to be that carbohydrate. And I suppose it's more in terms of that fueling element and I suppose uh, avoiding us going too too much into those glycogen stores and, and depleting them later on. Um, I suppose if we get to the end of a game or an end of a training session and we've completely depleted our glycogen stores, we'll probably have to be a bit more aggressive in terms of those recovery strategies. So if we can be really effective in our fueling strategies um, and our carbohydrate intake, for example, with with five games in a tournament back to back in terms of game one, equally as much as game five. Well, then that will help us later on in the tournament where if we're almost putting our bodies in a bit of a deficit it, from from not fueling well enough early on in tournaments that can can definitely have an impact later on. I want to turn it over to Will because Lauren's talked through quite a lot of information there. And I just wonder how that translates into different age groups that you would work with in a football academy because I'm aware we're talking elite level with with Lauren there and we're talking Olympics and and adults how do you translate some of what Lauren said into into academy based stuff yeah I must admit you know I'm listening to 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 everything that that Lauren touches on and and it's all fantastic it it really really is certainly within the academy it would perhaps be a, a a sort of higher level than than what we're doing. I think what what we're doing is purely just the the, the basics. Specifically, I mean, especially with with the younger age groups, those things like a balanced meal, are the type of things they should be putting on their plate. Whether something's a carbohydrate, a protein, you know, things like that, is is what we're doing at the the younger age groups. Really, it's it's more surrounding education sure as you get up towards the the older age groups certainly some of the athletes would would have a better level of understanding and you'd, you'd be able to to go into that level of detail that that Lawrence touched on but that's probably few and far between to be honest it, it's probably more you know teaching them the basics and and to be perfectly honest including the parents within that as well so a lot of our academy players up till the ages of 18 will be living either with their parents or with host families and digs so you know we've we've spent a long time i suppose educating the the players on education before realizing well actually the players aren't the ones making the the meals every evening actually we need you know we need the parents in on this as well they're the real sort of key stakeholders and they hold the i suppose the key to 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 what the athletes are ultimately eating but yeah all of the, the vast majority probably about 90-95% 90-95% of, of the education that we provide is is just surrounding the basics. It really is. So it, it sounds like we've got a good understanding um, of what we're doing exercise-wise, recovery-wise, should I say, and nu- nutrition-wise. Where, where are we missing things? Where, where are we going with research in the future? Like what questions are being left unanswered? And, and what, what are we looking at to kind of drive things forward in the future? What are the key things that we're looking at now to that we think might be you know, at the forefront of, of the future? I, th- I think there's several there's several aspects and I think we don't really know what the optimal strategies are at the moment. I think one of the key things I'd probably say, especially because we are talking about elite athlete performance, is that there just isn't enough studies in elite athletes at the moment. So getting elite athletes into a lab uh, and actually, you know, taking... <laughs> muscle biopsies, blood samples, or asking them to follow strict controls is very, very difficult. So we don't have that much data on actual elite athletes. We we generally have data on untrained individuals or people who are recreationally active, as we call them, who you know may go to the gym a few times per week, but they definitely don't recover at the same rate as an elite athlete would. They have completely different physiology and probably psychology as well when it comes to recovery. So that's a big challenge. I think another big challenge is in in the lab, one of the things that we often do is we use unrealistic protocols to try and actually get large amounts of muscle damage because it's probably easier to study. But the reality is this is not the type of exercise bouts that an elite athlete would do. So 
what we're actually looking at is not necessarily translatable to the real world and real world athletic performance. So I think that's a big thing. I think also we don't actually take into consideration all of the different types of strategies that are often used. So many have been mentioned and talked a lot about different nutritional strategies, but even at the basic level, we don't often do research where we'll give people, say, protein and carbohydrate, and then we'll also maybe give them a dietary supplement. It could be a supplement that's rich in antioxidants or anti-inflammatory. We don't often look whether these combined supplements actually has a benefit, maybe it has an antagonistic effect, or again, what if on top of that, we add in compression garments and ice baths and things like that, do these have good effects or bad effects? We, we don't really know what the combinations of all of these different recovery approaches that have been suggested has on the body. Yeah, for me, I suppose Tom mentioned there, we, we don't have enough research in those elite level athletes. I mean, for me at the minute, you know, we probably have even less overall in terms of the female athletes and in terms of how maybe some of these recovery elements and I suppose from my perspective, certain nutrients, if we're looking at a protein intake and your total, your timings, we, we probably have even less information out there in terms of how that affects female athletes in particular. And I suppose how that might be influenced by different stages, stages of the menstrual cycle potentially as well. So I think there's a there's a huge area of research still still needed to be done in terms of of female athletes as well. And Will, is there anything from from an academy perspective? I don't think there's a, a great deal to to touch on that, that, that Tom and Lauren already haven't really. You know, Tom made the point that I suppose there's like elite athletes who are a very very sought after subject group, and and certainly when you you know scouring the research to 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 find I suppose the effects of of certain supplements or you know, nutritional supplementations, it it's very difficult to to find I suppose papers that that replicate your cohort and your subject group. So that that would be the the big one from from my side really. It's a really, really valid point. Obviously, everybody needs specific research around them. And I suppose you're just working with the best research available and trying to practically implement those those challenges. And as as you've alluded to a lot, a lot of this becomes down to the individual. Will, I think you mentioned the placebo effect, really, and how you know numerous players might believe something's helping them. And maybe it is or maybe they've just gathered experience in certain ways, both using recovery methods and nutrition methods that just seem to work for them. But as you go through that academy into a professional athlete, you're hoping that they've learned the best method for them. I and mean, if not, you're educated around things and checking in what works, what doesn't work. So that, that's what I'm getting from this. Thank you very much for coming on. You've given us some some really good insights. I mean, you know, Tom, you gave us some great insights into what this really is and, you know, what muscle damage is, why recovery is important. Will, you've given us some really key points around nutrition, hydration and sleep as those key elements with the dressing around whether it's ice baths or compression and that individuality of choice. And then Lauren, you've obviously gone into some real good depth there around nutrition with some with some real good practical insights. And I think to move this forward, I think you're all saying that we need a bit more applied research and we also need specific research in areas such as female athletes and, and maybe different age groups that, that you all might be working with. Thanks for listening to the Loughborough Sportcast. If you want to get in touch and let us know any subject areas or experts that you'd be keen to listen to, then contact me, Martin Foster, on m.foster at alborough.ac.uk or tweet me at martinfoster82. Bye for now. We'll see you next time.